This episode is brought to you with support from PerfectDailyGrind.com. Perfect Daily Grind, your source for coffee education, articles, videos, and more, from the farm to the cup. Welcome back to the Coffee Podcast. Today, we dive back into a conversation with Jose Set, the Executive Director of the International Coffee Organization, an organization that has played a major role in coffee price historically. As we dive back in, I want to refresh the purpose of this series with a quick statement. The series is about reaching for understanding that may lead to solutions. From my seat, you are as much a part of this conversation as Jose is and as I am. I encourage you to consider how your thoughts and ideas of this episode in this series could contribute to a brighter future for coffee and coffee people worldwide. Listen to the end for some personal insight from me on the series. Enough chitter chatter for me for now. Let's get to it. This has been a very popular thing to say right now, especially in specialty coffee and in the specialty coffee uh, sector. Um, There's a lot of talk about breaking away from the sea market. What are your thoughts or what's your opinion on this idea of coffee breaking away from the sea market? Well, futures markets have two basic functions. Uh, First is price discovery, and the second is uh, risk management. And um, I think in terms of risk management, uh, it uh, fulfills, uh, the, the markets uh, fulfill their, their role uh, quite well. Um, uh, and uh, uh, today, um, uh, I, I've seen traders that uh, when, when prices are attractive, they will buy uh, from growers like uh, two, three years out, which is a tremendous uh, guarantee uh, for uh, a grower. Mm. But, but um, there is a lot of concern about the, the other function of, the, of futures markets, which is the price discovery mechanism. And here, um, I think uh, uh, some of the criticisms have uh, uh, merit, uh, the especially the C contract uh, in New York really today reflects a basket of Arabic uh, uh, coffee from uh, many different origins and of many different qualities instead of the underlying um, uh, um, physical product that is uh, uh, supposed to um, uh, to to be deliverable against the contract. So I do understand uh, the concerns of many, many people. Um, and uh, to, to address this, and uh, one of our uh, important functions is to try and uh, look at the, the issues related to coffee in an analytical manner, in a dispassionate manner, in a neutral manner, Uh, We recently produced a study, an econometric study, uh, of the impact of uh, what is technically called non-commercial traders, but let's call them speculators, uh, in uh, coffee futures markets. And uh, there were three main conclusions uh, for this uh, study. One is, and here I'll, I'll... I'll have to use uh, some very uh, weasel language, uh, but that is how uh, economists express themselves. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, The first is uh, speculative activity has predictive power over spot market prices in specific short time periods. What uh, to translate this is means uh, uh, the economists don't like to say uh, one is the cause of the other, but um, it, the, the um, speculation is linked to price movements in very in short time periods. Now, the second um, uh, 
conclusion of this study was that there is no significant evidence of speculative activity affecting spot market prices uh, during this uh, uh, continuous downtrend in the market that we are experiencing over the last uh, more than two years. And the third, uh, and I think this is the most important uh, conclusion of the study, is that uh, speculation can exacerbate price trends in the short term, but the fundamentals of supply and demand prevail in the long term. So I, I, I think we have to uh, approach this question carefully. Uh, I believe that uh, the people who run uh, futures exchanges are, have an open mind. They are willing to consider uh, different uh, uh, contract uh, uh, structures, different, uh, but we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater just because we are concerned about the, the impact of speculation. Uh, I think uh, uh, the, the overall benefits of the, of the futures markets outweigh uh, these uh, issues. Now you moving on to the, another part of your question is uh, you talked about uh, the specialty uh, market and the way uh, there is uh, impetus to move away uh, from from uh, the C market, the, the futures markets. And there, I think uh, this is a, a healthy trend. Um, I, I think it's uh, one of the great... Um, uh, characteristics of the specialty market is this, uh, there's a more opportunity for uh, direct relationships with growers, you buy directly, uh, the established long-term contracts. So I think all of this is very healthy, very healthy. I'm a fan of the, of the specialty market, but we have to, to uh, place it into a wider context and uh, uh, I, the, the, the figures for the size of the specialty market are uh, controversial, but let's say it's less than 20% of the overall uh, coffee production. So um, solutions that work for the specialty sector are not necessarily replicable uh, uh, in the wider mainstream market. So when somebody says... Yeah, the specialty market just needs to break break away from the C market. Like, what would you say? You're just in a, in a passing conversation. What would you say to that person? It's uh, good for for roasters and good for growers uh, to establish these direct relationships and uh, to try and set up uh, long term contracts that will give. Uh, the grower a, a peace of mind, let's say, uh, to uh, um, to plant and uh, to to structure his operations in a longer term, and to not be afraid of uh, the type of downturn uh, that we are seeing mm -hmm. in the market today. Now there is a there is a downside to this: is that uh, one of the, the consequences of the situation we are in today is that we are, the, the coffee production is getting gradually more concentrated in a smaller number of highly efficient producing countries. And so that means that the overall market uh, is vulnerable to price shocks from uh, political uh, uh, problems or from climatic problems in mm. one of its major producers. Okay, yeah, I and see. If that happens, if you are in a long-term contract, if you honor the contract uh, and prices explode, you are losing out on the upside, let's say. So, mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, uh, um, in, the, in a, a wider picture, in a, in a broader perspective, 
um, the growers uh, gain from these uh, uh, direct relationships and long-term contracts. Right. It kind of goes back to what you said earlier about looking for those shared responsibilities. Um, I feel like that's come up a few times in our conversation and, and those uh, direct relationships, um, uh, you know, no telling how direct they really are, but they're, um, they kind of promote that idea of shared risk and shared relationship, don't you think? Exactly. And uh, we, we are moving into very exciting times in terms of technology also. So mm -hmm. uh, I think we are close to the point where uh, with a, a blockchain or something, mm -hmm. uh, you want <laughs> to add a, a tip to your cup of coffee, yeah. uh, you can be sure that it goes directly to uh, the grower. Uh, right. I'm, I'm not sure that we're still there, but uh, this mm -hmm. is... This is really on the horizon. Right, right. Well, Jose, I'll, I'll tell you, we're moments away from, uh, I was just in Guatemala for the first blockchain auction, and um, they're uh, almost complete with the system uh, to be released for those coffees that were purchased. So those systems are right around the corner. I mean, I'm, I think even this year. So yeah, we're, we're right on top of that. So, yes, I, I participated in the launch of a a contract, uh, a blockchain contract uh, in India uh, in uh, March. So uh, oh, wow. I think uh, this is uh, uh, one of the, the ways forward. And uh, it, uh, it's a very promising and very interesting. Let's move to some more of the questions that we have here as we're coming close to the end of our time. So history shows the international coffee agreements have focused a good deal on promoting coffee consumption through funds provided through the organization's um, structure. Are there funds currently in place to support research and to promote consumption as there was before in other agreements? Well, promotion of consumption is very important for the sustainability of uh, coffee. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, during the old days when the ICO was a market regulator, uh, this was a system which had a lot of uh, uh, built-in checks and balances, let's say. So pro uh, producing countries were supposed to get a higher price than the market would have provided them. Um, but at the same time, uh, they uh, uh, had certain obligations. And one of the obligations was to contribute towards a promotion fund. And uh, this uh, went on for a while. If we look at the history of the specialty coffee movement, um, I wouldn't say the ICO is the, the father, but um, at least it was <laughs> a very uh, a kind uh, stepfather or something. It, it gave movement a push uh, uh, along this is the late 80s I'm, uh, I'm really thinking about mm, uh, okay. when um, when uh, the ICO stimulated especially uh, consumption of coffee in uh, universities uh, at that time and uh, you probably won't remember <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't think I won't. I think I can't. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, coffee was an old people's drink. Mm. Uh, go on YouTube and uh, look at uh, old uh, coffee TV commercials. Uh, mm -hmm. I get a, a brand like Folgers or Maxwell House and uh, look at uh, uh, coffee commercials from the 60s and the 70s. Mm. And it's all old people like me. Uh, <laughs> and people were very worried about the future of coffee. So um, this, uh, uh, this, that is why I am so enthusiastic about the specialty coffee movement. Hmm. I'm, uh, I'm a big fan. Um, but we're talking about the past. Let's uh, talk more about uh, the present. Um, so when the... The quota system ended and uh, uh, the ICO was no longer a market regulator, uh, the producing countries uh, no longer contributed to this uh, promotion fund. Mm 
And now we our our resources are very limited. Now one one initiative that uh, I think uh, of ours, which is very valuable, is that. Uh, just over 10 years ago, we produced what's called the step-by-step -step guide to promoting coffee consumption in producing countries, hmm. which built on the su successful experience of Brazil, which today is the world's la uh, second largest uh, uh, coffee consuming country, and others. So this guide was used as a template uh, for the launch of uh, um, promotional campaigns in several producing countries. Uh, some were more successful than others, but it was a positive experience on the whole. Now, the guide is uh, starting to show its age, and uh, we are looking to uh, renew it, to, to um, get together a revised version, to look at... Uh, everything that has changed uh, uh, since uh, it was first released uh, and um, to uh, uh, come up with new ideas for promoting uh, coffee consumption. So mm. we are at the beginning of this uh, process. We are surveying our members about um, uh, their experiences uh, and uh, we are also looking for funding. So if any of your uh, uh, <laughs> listeners have some uh, spare change, uh, 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 we are always uh, happy uh, to receive uh, support. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. So we talked about breaking uh, coffee away from the sea market. We talked about, uh, you know, the, the funds that there are to promote this research and the materials for promoting consumption in uh, consuming uh, regions. Um, and this next question is kind of a, what I'd call a doozy. It's kind of a, a heavy question. So history also shows that coffee has been built on cheap labor and cheap land. Um, and the ICO has tackled issues of working conditions in the recent agreements. Um, but I'm curious, how does the ICO view and take action on issues like low coffee prices today on already low prices paid to producers and laborers? This is a complicated uh, uh, issue. I I think, and uh, here I I look back on my experience in cotton. Um, I think uh, coffee is relatively, and uh, I will emphasize the word relatively. Um, uh, I wouldn't say immune, but um, it's not as badly affected by these issues as some other. Commodities, but that's no real reason for uh, complacency on our part. Mm -hmm. um, we have to, we have a lot of work to do um, in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, cutting down uh, deforestation. Although, and uh, this is a, uh, although a big uh, in uh, coffee production. Uh, has, uh, I don't know, doubled in the last 30 years, but the planted area has remained almost the same or even gone down. So this is a sign of the tremendous uh, efforts uh, growers are making in terms of uh, yields, uh, of uh, in improving productivity. But mm -hmm. uh, So that is one aspect. Uh, we have to look at the question of uh, forced labor and child labor, although... And uh, thankfully, uh, this is, uh, it's not to say that it doesn't occur in coffee, but uh, it is less prevalent than in some of our sister commodities. We have, and uh, this is a, a, a theme that uh, is especially dear to my heart, is that uh, we have to promote gender equality. Uh, and unlock uh, the potential that uh, uh, is uh, uh, out there in women and that is not uh, fully uh, exploited. Uh, there's, there's a lot to do in that regard. Um, we have to involve uh, young people and farmers. Uh, uh, farming uh, is uh, seen as a, a dull activity, um, compared to going to the big city and uh, uh, being on the internet and all that uh, kind of stuff. So 
there's a lot of uh, uh, things uh, to be done. But I think at the moment, our, our real focus is on prices, Jesse. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, if, uh, um, if we don't have uh, decent prices, then uh, none of these other um, elements uh, in the sustainability equation uh, hold themselves up. Thanks for, thanks for tackling that uh, question. And we, we've now come to the end of our time uh, for this content. So I have some closing questions I'd like to ask you and kind of start with a statement. You know, we have uh, baristas, roasters, coffee enthusiasts, all kinds of coffee lovers who listen to the podcast. How would you instruct these listeners to take real action to help mitigate the effects of the price crisis? I think the, the type of... The- Types of people you're talking about are really the, the consumers of uh, specialty coffee. And uh, I've already said how much of a fan I am of uh, this sector. But please encourage your, your local coffee shop uh, to uh, establish direct relationships with uh, growers, uh, tell their story. Uh, we, we, we need to get the story behind the coffee uh, out there. It's, uh, it's a tough uh, proposition. Uh, you, you've been to a growing country, so I'm mm-hmm. sure it's, you've seen uh, how, how complicated it is. So um, I think the specialty coffee market is a, a spearhead uh, that uh, um, um, increases uh, sensitivity uh, uh, to all these issues and encourages quality, which is also very important. So um, uh, I I, I think uh, uh, the easiest way forward is the specialty market, but um, we have to always bear in mind that that's a a fraction of the entire market, and we have to work uh, very hard with uh, the the commodity side of uh, coffee. And... Mm -hmm. uh, this, I think, uh, has to be done more at the level that we work with uh, in terms of uh, governments and uh, uh, large corporations. But that doesn't mean uh, uh, your listeners cannot um, uh, put a pressure on uh, these uh, uh, corporations uh, to do more in terms of uh, corporate social responsibility. Hmm. And uh, what, what resources would you recommend to our listeners? Well, there are three things I would like to talk about. Uh, uh, First is this uh, sector-wide dialogue that uh, I have uh, talked about. Uh, We have had uh, these uh, five events uh, so far, but all these events are really uh, warm-ups for the big, uh, big one uh, in September, which will be held, which will be on the. 23rd of September, and um, you can, oh, you'll be able to join by live feed, Mm. and uh, even better, there are a limited number of uh, uh, spaces open to the public, and uh, we'd love to see coffee lovers there, and not just uh, um, the the gray hairs like me. Um, (laughs) um, So, uh, please. Um, follow uh, this, our efforts uh, on our website. We have produced uh, some, I think, interesting background material uh, that uh, uh, is, uh, that will be of use uh, to anybody with an interest in coffee. Um, So uh, please uh, uh, follow, participate, um, uh, use our uh, structured dialogue as a jump-off uh, point uh, to uh, uh, other things. Now, hmm. the second second plug I want to make uh, is uh, our work uh, to enhance the transparency of the coffee market. And this is done through providing reliable and neutral statistics and also economic studies. So please uh, go on our website. Uh, our statistics are... Uh, for the most part, they are free of charge. So you can, uh, those that are interested in an uh, analysis of the coffee market, uh, you can um, you can go there. We produce a monthly coffee market report. 
And we also uh, produce these uh, uh, more in-depth reports like the one I talked to you about on the futures markets. Mm -hmm. And third and final uh, plug, please, uh, we have this initiative called International Coffee Day, which is celebrated on October 1st. And we have a dedicated website uh, for that, which is www.internationalcoffeeday.org. And um, that will have a variety of materials. Uh, we are setting up the website uh, for this year's edition, which uh, will focus on the question of economic sustainability. Mm, okay. But have a look at uh, the current setup, which is uh, more focused on last year's campaign, which uh, was uh, centered on women and coffee. And uh, I think uh, there, there's some interesting uh, stuff there. And then all your uh, listeners, uh, your coffee shop owners, I would encourage them to get on board, use our October 1st as a day to promote a coffee. I would be so bold as to suggest to uh, um, to give away a free cup of coffee to some of your, your clients uh, um, <laughs> and uh, also to share your uh, experiences with us uh, um, uh, electronically. Um, the campaign for uh, International Coffee Day 2019 is uh, being put together as we talk. I had a, a meeting this morning about uh, uh, this, and I think it will be uh, very exciting. Um, but uh, we need uh, everybody's collaboration, everybody to, to come in and uh, use the materials we put at your disposal and uh, to give us uh, feedback also. Excellent. Well, thanks for sharing those resources. We're going to close out with uh, one of our listeners' favorite questions. It's uh, It doesn't have to be related to coffee. It's, it's more of a life advice question. Um, so the question is, what is the best piece of advice you've received over the years, and what has it taught you? Jesse, my, my mind right now is um, really focused on the question of uh, uh, prices and economic sustainability and um, how how to how to improve the situation and here I am always reminded of a quote by the great uh, American journalist HL Mencken he once said the following uh, for every complex human problem there is an answer that is clear simple and wrong my conclusion from all this, there's a lot of emotions uh, involved uh, around uh, the current coffee price levels. But we have to look at this dispassionately uh, on a, a fact-based basis. And we have to recognize that there's no single silver bullet that will resolve all our problems. Uh, we have to work on many different fronts at the same time. And uh, um, each uh, actor, each economic agent uh, has his or her own uh, environment and characteristics that uh, make, uh, uh, make them uh, best suited to pursue sustainability in one way or another. So there's no single magical solution, but we all have to have the spirit of shared responsibility and uh, work together uh, for the benefit of the sector as a whole and especially the, the smallholder farmers. Mm. Jose, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for sharing all your experience, your knowledge, and your perspectives today on the show. Oh, it's been an honor to participate in my first podcast, uh, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, always at your disposal, and uh, I wish uh, your uh, listeners a, a many uh, cups of coffee. With the conclusion of this episode, I've reached an interesting place in my journey aimed at understanding this crisis. I have a lot of information sloshing around in my mind. 
I have a global historical view from Morris, additive information about coffee disease from the cook, and now this conversation was set. The series is not over, but I realize this is a lot of information to process. Let me get real with you for a moment. One of my biggest fears setting into this series was that it would be too boring for you. I had a discussion just today with a friend of mine and I was hashing out how I wondered and feared that people would get bored with the series and give up on it altogether. He's a geologist, so he definitely gets what I mean. We kind of laughed about it and left our thoughts open-minded about the balance of entertainment and education and educational material. I want you to know that what I want this to be is beneficial to you and thus beneficial to all coffee people everywhere. It may not always have you on the edge of your seat, but I want to have you on the frontier of the conversations and coffee. A lot of these big size conversations get oversimplified in the media for obvious reasons, and I feel a sort of unfiltered conversation with experts allows for those finer details to peek out. I wanted to peel back and tell you my heart in these things. I hope this content is benefiting you greatly. Now, as a side, I have something fun for you to check out. I didn't make it, but I know the person who did. A co-podcaster in coffee named James just released an episode in his new series on coffee in El Salvador. Here's James and a little snippet I asked him to send me. Hey there, I'm James. I'm an Italian-Australian with this kind of weird accent. So I've worked in specialty coffee since 2014 in Australia, in Berlin, and I kept running up against the same issue. You know, where our coffees came from felt like this black box. So two years ago, I quit my job in Berlin, bought some microphones and this plane ticket to Guatemala. I recorded all these stories and then I created filter stories. They're investigative journalism documentaries. I see filter stories like this journey where you and I peel back the layers to see the realities of the coffee world. And this journey has already completely changed my relationship to specialty coffee. I'm going to put a link in the bio for you to go check out that podcast episode. I appreciate you lending your ears and sharing your thoughts. Please share your ideas and feedback on iTunes or wherever you listen. Email me with feedback at hello at thecoffeepodcast.org. I want to give a special shout out to our listeners in Spain. Thanks for tuning in. Music is by Michael Parallax. I'm Jesse Hartman. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, and until next time, happy brewing.